Hello and good morning again. So I think we should get started. So have fun. We'll hear something about metrics 2.0 and how to break the communication silos um, and the UE Digital Markets Act. Thank you very much. Let's go. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is cruel and unusual to be here at 10 o'clock in the morning for me, quite alone, you guys. So thank you, everybody, um, for turning up to hear all about the latest things of Matrix and, indeed, the European Union Digital Markets Act. Um, this, is, this talk is going to be in two halves. First of all, we're going to talk about Matrix 2.0 and where things are at that, there, and then we're going to switch through to the DMA side. So don't think you're being shortchanged that the first half doesn't really talk about DMA because we will make up for it later unless I run out of time, at which point it will all be about Matrix 2.0. So hopefully folks know that Matrix is an open network for security network for secure decentralized real-time communication. I'm Matthew. I'm the project lead and co-founder. Matrix gets used for lots of things, but today we will be talking about chat and VoIP. We will not be talking about fancy stuff like VR, AR, or IoT. Our mission continues to be to build the real-time communication layer of the open web, where no single party can ever own your conversations, where conversations are replicated in some magical utopia between all participants. Some stats. Um, so this year I thought we'd look at monthly active users reported home by servers. So when you install Synapse or Dendrites, you have the option to go and report stats back to the mothership. If you do, it ends up in a MySQL database called Panoptigan, and we aggregate it together there to see where things are at. If you look at where things were at back in January of last year, we were at about 2 million monthly active users, and since then we have more than doubled up to almost 4.5 million active users, um, monthly active users. And people always ask when they see these graphs, does this include bridged users? And I asked Neil, who wrote this, and said, Neil, does this include bridged users? And he said, no. So these are real, proper matrix users with access tokens talking on actual home servers. So it's not exponential at the moment, but it's pretty reassuringly linear going up, and um, you can see how the wider public network is growing there. Um, another random metric, which I think we have to talk about, is that Stack Overflow um, every year polls everybody on Stack Overflow as to what their favorite technology is. And for the synchronous communications tool this year, and this came out, I think, last week or the week before, they asked people what their most desired tool was and also what their most admired tool was. And honestly, we were pretty chuffed. The Matrix came in as the most admired, i.e. hyped, um, synchronous communication tool, going and even beating Discord by 0.3 of a percent. Um, also, the most desired open source one, unless you consider Signal to be open source, which is a little bit controversial. Um, so kind of fun to see that at least in the geek Stack Overflow community, people appreciate the stuff that we are doing with Matrix. Now, I wanted to talk about uptake across the sort of real world of Matrix because the project does continue to grow and grow and decided to focus on the public sector. So what I've done is to try to map out um, all of the big public sector deployments that I know of, of Matrix, across the world. And what I've tried to also do is to call out the minor problem, if you haven't noticed, that we have around funding Matrix development at the moment, in that there are many dots on this map here, and if we go from left to right, we go from kind of thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of users on the size of these deployments. And then the size of the yellow circles shows you roughly how much um, these deployments contribute back to the costs of the core team working on Matrix with the Matrix Foundation or the folks who work at Element um, on the core team. And as you can see, it's a little bit um, asymmetrical in that we have our friends at BWI um, who support a lot for BV Messenger, an awful lot of Element X and Matrix REST SDK is thanks to their support. We have the Open Desk project uh, with BMI in Germany. We have the Phoenix Suite, which is um, sovereign workplace capability um, done by Dataport. We've got some, all the schools in NRW with Baron Point and Loginio. And then there are some smaller deployments like in Sweden, US, UK, NATO, 
etc. But some of the really big ones, like CHAP or Luxembourg or Hessen or Bavaria, which are you know, in millions of users, are contributing very, very little back to the core project in terms of cash, at least in 2023. We're hoping to fix this um, in, well, hopefully, all of these instances, hence calling them out here. However, across 2023, honestly, we had a really crap year. Um, first of all, we'd been depending a lot on COVID funding, which evaporated as the pandemic sort of became a well, endemic rather than a pandemic. And um, general macroeconomic slowdown thanks to post-COVID and the situation in Ukraine. This problem of lots and lots of deployments basically not helping fund the underlying dev. We also found a really interesting problem that the FSFE's mantra of public money for public code encourages governments to only fund features we find. It's like, this is taxpayer money, we have to go and put this to something demonstrable, therefore can we implement, I don't know, polls, can we implement um, location sharing, can we do 3D location sharing? And we're saying, guys, what we really need is to support the core foundations. We need encryption that works. We need a Rust SDK that is indestructible and audited and all this stuff. And it turns out that getting funding for the maintenance layer is quite hard. So really, 2023 was pretty miserable. We had to shrink the core team as well as element significantly. And this is basically manifested as forcing focus. So right now, we are focusing on Matrix 2.0, Synapse, Rust SDK, and Element X on top, JS SDK for Element Web and Element Core, and nothing else. So I'm sorry, but if you're hoping that I'm going to strap on an Apple Vision Pro and launch myself off the stage demonstrating VR, it ain't going to happen this year. Everything else is paused. Peer-to-peer -peer matrix is on hold. Pseudo IDs and crypto IDs, despite the amazing work that Devon did over the course of 2023 to set up for account portability, where you replace matrix IDs with public keys so you can port between servers, completely shelved for now. Low bandwidth matrix, so using noise and other transports for really low bandwidth, is gone. Dendrite is continuing, but um, not funded by Element for now at least. Critical bug fixes only on the old iOS and Android SDKs. So the classic Element iOS and Android apps, if you haven't noticed, have been since June. Um, Libol, the old C++ encryption implementation, again, is just in critical bug fix and security fix only mode, replaced by Vodosmats, the Rust encryption implementation. And poor old third room is completely on hiatus now, and the team has gone on to other things involving Apple, Apple Vision Pros, ironically. So, and this is also a real shame, as in, in a different world, I'll be showing you some really cool stuff in the third room, and if you're interested in the 3D on Matrix stuff, go and check out the final release they did, because it had the entire direct manipulation in World Editor, complete with um, write your own like, apps on top of it in real time, and it was really cool. Meanwhile, on the element side, um, uh, we ended up switching developments of Synapse to AGPL, away from the Apache license, as a fairly desperate measure to try to get folks who build on top of Synapse uh, to contribute back to either the code or the costs of building it. So long story short, for Matrix to prevail, we really need your support. So the foundation that looks after the spec and many other aspects of Matrix now runs entirely independently with Josh Simmons, um, he used to be president of OSI as managing director. Um, they've gone and set up a governing board from across the ecosystem, which is going to steer the direction of the project. We have elections for that in April. If you want to get involved, become a member, vote, put yourself forward for the governing board, and you too can steer the direction of the protocol. Right now, there is a funding drive that we launched earlier in the week to support the core spec work, trust and safety, bridging, running matrix.org infrastructure and governance work, and the target there is 900K. Please get involved. If you're in this room and you're not just chipping in, couple of, well, I think it's like 60 bucks a year from memory, so whatever that is, and coffee, please, please get involved. And meanwhile, do you remember that an awful lot of, well, almost all of github.com slash matrix slash org is actually maintained by the core team who now work at Element, who donates, and Element donates their time to the project. So if you're a government hypothetically wanting to use uh, matrix, please work with Element to support the underlying infrastructure. That said, lots of people getting involved. We have 716 individual donors already. We've got some amazing companies like Beeper and XWiki, Gematic, the German um, healthcare um, interoperability agency, Faircom, obviously Element, Cryptpad, and Thunderbird all signed up now as organizational members. 
So, enough plea for help. Let's talk about Matrix 2 quickly. So we introduced uh, Matrix 2.0 last year at Fosdem 2023. The mission is to make Matrix as fast and as usable as the mainstream alternatives. So practically speaking, that means it syncs instantly, logs in instantly, and launches instantly. You can join rooms instantly, or at least fast. You get native VoIP with end-to-end -end encryption, and you get OpenID Connect. This is not a new spec release yet. I have to say that, otherwise Travis will go and kill me. Um, this is showcased in Matrix Rust SDK and is then used in Element X and quite a lot of it in Fractal 5 and 6 in GNOME. So I have to say, last year when I stood here and enthused about Matrix 2.0, it was very alpha. Like we got the demo working at 3 a.m. the night before or something like that. So all of 2023 has been polishing this and trying to get it into the proper production. And in September, we did launch it in the form of Element X Ignition to everybody so they could actually play with it. Rather than talking about it, let me show you where things are at. And probably the easiest way to do that might be to just show you my Element X. Um, so hopefully that is coming up and is vaguely visible. Or perhaps not. Let me zoom in a bit. Is that more visible? So this is just my personal account. I'm not going to log in again. Uh, apparently we've got a blinking stream. Apologies if we've got painful flickering of the slides. Um, sorry if you're online. Um, but uh, this is kind of fun. Hello, world. You can see um, since last year many, many things going on here. We've got our read receipts going down the right-hand side. We've gone and got fancy animations as people go and heckle the animation. Obviously, the login and the launch is as fast as it ever was. But we've really gone and fleshed out a lot of the features here. So, for instance, I could uh, not navigate my laptop whilst I'm zoomed in. I could, for instance, go and send a location share. And this is using OpenStreetMap and with uh, Mapbox and MapLibre in the background. Um, so I can go and say that I'm in Brussels and hit share on that and it will come up. Um, I could go and show off things like the rich text um, editor, or at least I thought I could, although I might have it turned off on this account. Let me go and um, dip into our beautiful settings, go into advanced settings, turn the rich text editor on, go back out again. And now, if I go down here, I can say text formatting. And this is an entire, this isn't using the sort of native iOS, macOS stuff. This is a Rust um, rich text editor that we actually bought that would be cross platform across Android, iOS, and web. And I can say hello world, like that, go and select uh, bold it, and I don't know, turn a link on it, or well, whatever else I need to do. And by the way, this is obviously the iOS app, but running on macOS also runs on iPad. I'm just doing it here on um, uh, macOS because it's easier to demo rapidly. And yes, Bundes Messenger is from the BB Messenger creators, but if you use Bundes Messenger, at the moment at least, nothing directly comes back to us, just saying. Um, what else can I show you whilst I'm in here? Perhaps you can show a voice message, which will probably get deleted by the, um, uh, uh, by the moderation system. But if I give it permission to use my microphone here, you can see me blathering away like this. Um, go and hit stop on it, so I can obviously go and replay that here. Okay, you can see me blah, 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 and go and hit send. And with any luck, the moderation system will go and kick in and promptly delete it because it's not helpful for people to go and send voice messages into rooms or not. Um, so as you can see, things have gone and um, uh, moved on an awful lot from where they were on Element X um, uh, a few years ago. Uh, we also have these beautiful gray dots, which are surprisingly hard to put together. These are unread status, and one of the things we try to get right in Element um, X is calculating unread state correctly. Everybody, I suspect, will be aware that over the last year we've had a lot of problems with stuck notifications and unread state on Element Web, and we were determined to get it right here on Element X instead. So, um, what else can I tell you there? That's probably enough now. Let's go back to um, the actual slides and possibly zoom out a bit. So, let's quickly talk about the component bits of sliding sync um, of Element X. The big one here is sliding sync. The idea is that the server should only tell the client about the rooms that the client needs to display. So, it should be constant complexity with the number of rooms rather than linear complexity with the number of rooms. To say that it's been a bit of a journey is an understatement. Since last year, we have rewritten the entire REST SDK implementation. We've gone and added the unread room state, as we mentioned. But we've really come up against a fundamental problem here. What is the right balance between server-side calculation of the order of the rooms that you care about and the client-side calculation? 
Now, the original genius idea from yours truly was that we would completely rip off Discord and we would calculate the ordering entirely server-side. The clients get a sliding window into that, and then you, rec- you send updates to the client um, uh, as the ordering changes on the server. Now, obviously, that's not going to work with end-to-end encryption because for end-to-end encrypted rooms, only the client knows for sure what the correct ordering is. But that will be all right. We'll fix it up on the client. And so you'll get the optimal solution, pre-order on the server, and then fix it up in the client. It turns out this is a disastrous idea. It is a real pain in the ass to implement. It was a pain in the ass to implement it last year. It was then a pain in the ass to re-implement it. And we're at the point now where even I realized that it was a terrible idea, and people are saying, guys, please, can we simplify this a little bit? Because the problem is that really, clients are the only ones who know the right order. End-to-end encrypted rooms are pretty common these days, and so the fix-up um, process would be entirely horrible, and we've never really even got it right. So what we're doing instead is to switch to sort primarily on the client, and we use course heuristics on the server um, to send a rough estimation of the correct ordering, and we're sort of naming this or dubbing it pragmatic sync. However, this is a subset of sliding sync, but without the <coughs> sliding bit. So. Not quite implemented yet. Um, I saw that a PR pops up um, a few days ago from Ivan um, 3068 on the Rust SDK repository that does actually implement client-side um, ordering as well as lays the groundwork for filtering rooms there. Now, as a result, we're not yet doing native sliding sync implementations because we are still iterating on the API. As I said, this is just deleting stuff now. It's not a massive rework or anything. It's just simplifying it to make it easier to work with as an API. And lots of people say, I'm not going to use sliding sync until it's native, until it's firmly in the spec. Seriously, it's really easy to run one of these. It is just a single blob of Go. You build it, you give it a Postgres database, and you run it, and you point one URL at it on your load balancer, and you're done. And I, I've done it, and I never had to touch it again other than to occasionally update it. So please do dog food this, play with it in Element X. Then on the end-to-end group VoIP, lots and lots of fun stuff. Let me do a very quick demo, and I'm already running later on time. Uh, let me go to core.element.io, and you are welcome to try to follow along on this. So I'm going to go and start a Element call, um, call here. I'm going to chuck that into the Fosdam room so that other people can click on it as well. Now, you may see, if you look carefully up here, that the URL has not just got a matrix room ID, but it also has a password, because this is now using end-to-end encryption, um, backed by LiveKit as the selective forwarding unit. And I'm hoping that somebody is going to be able to join this. Otherwise, the demo might suck a little bit. Oh, there we go. Amandine again. Thank you for rescuing me. Thanks, haha links. Anybody else welcome to jump in? And we can crash the, the Wi-Fi here. So I might even mute this. Um, so this is entirely... Woo. So this is really the great sort of the descendant of the demo that we did last year, except this is a real one. Oh, hi, Andy. Thanks for dialing in at home. Um, so what, we're, what we see here is a LiveKit-based selective forwarding unit with end-to-end encryption using S-frames negotiated over matrix um, so that you basically get best of both worlds. This is a normal matrix room. Um, it is, uh, no, uh, it can be integrated with OpenID Connect. But because it's using LiveKit on the back end, it's only showing you the streams that you care about. So if I were to go, in fact, this is pretty cool. If I go um, to a a foreground tab like that and then switch back again, whilst I switch to the other tab, all the other streams will have dropped off. And if you're looking at my bandwidth up there, you might have even seen it. You can also see this is only doing like 300K out and 150K in, which is not too shabby um, at all. So you can use this today. I mean, that's basically what we've been promising all along, end-to-end encrypted native VoIP. Now, there is one other quick thing that I will endeavor to show, um, which is if I go over to my phone here, and I'm going to hang up on this one, um, I actually go and launch Element X. Then we also have this embedded properly into um, Element X itself. So if I go also to here and go over to my normal Element Web, then this is a little internal room called VoIP Water Cooler. And this is a um, uh, basically element call embedded inside Element Web, hopefully. And you have the chat room here on the right hand side. And if I go over here, I go and click the join button. 
and the demigods are smiling on me, then we will see ah, that there are people in here too. Now, you might think, wow, this is amazing. It's just got an iframed, and hopefully the video will come in, um, the previous thing. But what we're actually seeing here is a bit more exciting if the, in front of me, let, let's focus. Oh, that's interesting. The screen share isn't working um, from quite time for some reason. That's annoying. Let me use the analog gap in a few locations here. So there we go. That's what you should be seeing um, on uh, my phone if the screen share was working correctly. I would go and, you can double click on things to go and zoom in. And you can see roughly what's going on, except the stupid blurring has gone and blurred it out. And let's take off the background blurring. There we go. Much better. So this is not just end-to-end -end encrypted with a static key like the previous one. This is actually using senders as, um, sender keys. So it's using your same matrix identity. Um, so here I am as my normal matrix account. Florian is on um, his. Amandine is on hers. Timo is on his, etc. So this is fully... Uh, no, it, this gives you all of the properties that you would get of normal matrix in terms of forward secrecy and keys which are rotating forwards and which are linked to specific people. It even gives you multiple devices, as you can see, because I'm actually using this as myself, as Matthew, on both phone and on the um, embedded thing. So this is pretty cool. This is the shape of things to come. Element X is only going to use this. It's not going to use Jitsi, and we'll switch over from Jitsi on Element Web real soon now. And then we live in a promised utopic land, utopic? utopian land of end-to-end um, -end encrypted video. Right. Thank you. Um, where are my slides? Here are my slides. So, oh, if you want to see more about this, come to the dev room, see interoperability with Fluffy Chat, which is a really cool demo, because this isn't just Element Core, this is standards-based matrix land, and yeah, we just need to basically finish the spec and turn it on everywhere. Then, OpenID Connect, the great transition is in full swing. If you haven't realized, OpenID Connect is going to make the world an amazing place. It gives you pass keys, MFA, 2FA, single click login via QR code, complete with end-to-end -end encrypted identity. No more emoji verification, just scan a QR code and bang, you are in. Um, no more leaking passwords everywhere, consistent auth account management, um, actual proper password manager integration, proper SSO support, access token refresh, as well as scope, so that you can lock down what things your app can do. Um, here is a quick screenshot. I don't have time to do an actual demo showing what the sort of UX is like when you log in now to a SSO um, thing in Element X land or indeed from Element Web. And it gives you, obviously, details about your IP address, your scopes, the privileges that you're granting the app, and it really is a transformation from where we have been before. You can run this today um, via Matrix Authentication Service. It sits alongside Synapse, written in Rust. It gives you this UI. We do now have migration from Synapse using the Syntomass tool. It provides some backwards compatibility for Matrix Auth, but there are some missing bits. It does require a native OIDC capable client like Element X or indeed Labs on Element Web. Finally, Rust SDK work. Obviously, this all hinges around Rust SDK with the Matrix 2.0 implementation there for sliding sync and OIDC. We've added in this UI crate that gives you the high-level UI components, which basically power what we've been looking at. Then on the crypto side, very happy to say that we have basically killed off use of Libom in the main projects here. Everything is now using Vodosmat. This merged on Element Web and React SDK and Jess SDK on Friday, like three days ago. And this finally lets us fix end-to-end -end encryption bugs in one place and make encryption better in one place. Crypto reliability is now the name of the game. We've made a new weapon called Complement Crypto, which tests both Rust and JSSDK against real home servers written in, uh, running in Docker, written in Golang, gives you unhappy path and torture tests. We have our hit list of remaining encryption issues, and we are blitzing on going through them. The race is on. And then one of the advantages of having all of our encryption using uh, the Dosmats now is that, as if by magic, a draft post-quantum, XDH, PR appeared from Demir, who went on um, sabbatical for a few months and came back clutching PR120. So post-quantum coming potentially to Podosmat sometime soon. So what's next? Get it all released, get it audited, native sliding sync, get rid of the um, old SDKs completely, 
Um, potentially look at replacing JS SDK with Rust SDK if you knows. Lots of trust and safety work to be done, funded by the foundation as well as bridging. And then finally, DMA. Right, let's actually talk what the talk is meant to be about. DMA. So, Digital Markets Act mandates that communication services from the big tech companies have to talk together. The whole idea is that the user can pick their preferred service without being locked out from talking to their friends. Forces the big services to actually differentiate on being a better app rather than having a huge um, network of users and relying on the network effects to trap people into that app. Last year, we were about here, where the rules started to apply. And this year, we are about here, just before we have March the 7th is when legally the gatekeepers have to actually open up the silos. Right now, there is only one gatekeeper, Meta, specifically WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. And uh, we'll talk about um, where things are there. So we saw this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see if we can use Matrix as a common language um, to talk to these guys. There are probably three main ways of doing this. Either they can do open proprietary APIs, and you can do a multi-head messenger, a bit like Beeper Mini, where you just have an app that goes and talks through to the random API, albeit with permission this time. Um, or you have client-side bridging, where you install an app on, the, on your Android phone that just copies messages back and forth between WhatsApp and Matrix. So we actually built this and demoed it to the European Commission last year in February, just after FOSDEM. And, I mean, it works, but it's a bit hacky, honestly. Alternatively, you can have everybody talking the same protocol, like Matrix. So over the last year, we've really been experimenting with option three. So the problem is that the gatekeeper has to speak precisely the same end-to-end -end encryption as the person connecting to it. Um, and also, within the encrypted payloads, everybody needs to talk the same content. Good news, though, is that we picked the double ratchet for Matrix back in 2015 because basically it was best of breed and everybody was using it. So nowadays, everybody apart from Apple uses LibSignal or the Dosmats or LibOM under the hood for end-to-end -end encryption. Bad news, though, is that the normal Matrix dialect of OM is not interoperable with LibSignal. So OM is the encryption of Matrix. It was a clean room implementation of the double ratchet that we did back in 2015. But unlike um, LibSignal, uh, we don't use X25519 or X3DH. Instead, we have separate keys for identity and signing. So we've done two implementations of OLM as a protocol, LibOLM in C++ and Vodosmats in Rust. However, to do DMA, we have now added X3DH support to Vodosmats so that it can interoperate with LibSignal. And we've called this new dialect of OLM inter-OLM. And you can go and look at PR124 as of about 2 a.m. this morning um, to actually play with it and see that if you put the right constants in, this will now interoperate all the way through to normal lib signal. So this means that you can do a hypothetical matrix for DMA architecture where you have a typical matrix client like element X, which talks matrix through to a home server, which then goes and uses MSC 3983 and 3984 to bridge end-to-end -end encrypted semantics through an application service, which we call a protocol converter, because it's not really a bridge. It's maintaining end-to-end -end encryption. So it is converting the matrix signaling through to the hypothetical gatekeeper signaling, and then talks through on the gatekeeper side to their client. But the lib signal layer and the vodosmats in inter on mode on the matrix side can then talk directly. So you're basically turning the signaling on one side through to the signaling on the other. And as long as you can agree on a common content format of some kind, like matrix events expressed in protobuf or something like that, then you have the holy grail of being able to interoperate between matrix and a big, big messaging service. So the end result could hypothetically look something like this, where you have different gatekeepers um, who use a protocol converter to talk through to the normal public matrix network or some subset of it, you can have um, clients there uh, like ElementX or FluffyChat or whatever going and then talking through other bridges, and you'd have home servers that exist primarily to gateway into these gatekeepers, and so plug them all together. So does it work? Yes, this could work. So I got permission from Meta to admit that we have done experimental implementations of this now with them as a not-so-hypothetical gatekeeper. 
and it does seem viable, complete with end-to-end -end encryption. What I would love to do is to demo it to you right now, but because they have a great big set of announcements coming up about their DMA interop, they don't want me basically breaking their news for them at stage on Fosdem, unfortunately. So you will have to imagine in your mind's eye WhatsApp on one side and Element X on the other and messages flowing back and forth between the two with end-to-end -end encryption. Honestly, that would basically be all the demo would show. The catch is that we honestly don't know yet what will happen in March. I mean, there are some fairly big challenges here. First of all, what permissions would you need to actually use this protocol converter? Because the DMA letter of the law says that as an organization, you have to request permission to get into the WhatsApp network. So we've obviously done that already as Element, but it's very unclear as just because we've done it as Element that we've suddenly done it on behalf of the entire public matrix network and everybody else. Well, you'd hope, but let's see. Also, there's this whole question of anti-spam, where at the moment, folks depend an awful lot on knowing the IP address of the clients which connect through in order to determine um, you know, whether this is an abusive user, is it coming in through Tor, do we need to be more careful about what it's doing, blah, 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 blah. So there is a big debate as to whether we would need to expose a stable identifier of some kind, like an obfuscated IP address, to the gatekeeper to help with anti-spam. Then finally, a big one is that group chat is just unsolved. I mean, the current legislation only requires one-to-one -one DMs um, and you know, sort of basic functionality, no VoIP, um, and so group chat is out of scope until 2026. As a first cut, you could just do lots of OM sessions or inter-OM sessions and fan it out like we did before we had MegOM, but it's a bit clunky and it also gets things more and more baked into the double ratchet. So it may, hope, we're hoping that by 2026 a better approach might emerge, but at least this can be used, hopefully, from the get-go in March 2024. So one of the things we've um, discovered along the way is something we've called linearized matrix. So DMA doesn't mandate any of the cool stuff that matrix does. It doesn't mandate decentralized uh, conversation history, and um, it doesn't uh, you know, require decentralized access control. And what we've seen is that gatekeepers might see Matrix as a little bit overkill when implementing it natively. Just imagine a conversation where I turn up to somebody at WhatsApp or wherever and start going on about DAG replication and state resolution and decentralized ACLs and it's all so cool. And they sort of, you know, perhaps understandably would say, well, that's very nice, sir, but DMA doesn't say anything about that. Um, whilst we would love to implement state res in Erlang, perhaps um, we just need to worry about um, straightforward interoperability. So is there a lighter architecture that could work? What if we had a protocol that was compatible with Matrix, but skipped all the complicated state res stuff, knowing that we could bridge it into actual full fat proper Matrix when needed? So Travis and myself came up with this um, proposal called Linearized Matrix um, as part of the IETF Mimi working group. And it's literally the same Matrix events and power levels, even the same auth events, but rather than putting it in a DAG, you put it in a linked list. So it's much easier to play with because you just have a list of events. And you can then bang it around the place in a hub and spoke server topology, which is something that the gatekeepers might be willing to actually implement rather than full-blown matrix. But then the second it goes anywhere near us lot, we can just actually find it out into proper matrix. So we have an implementation of this, the amazingly named Eigen server, which is a bunch of TypeScript, about, what, a thousand lines of code from memory, um, that shows just how simple it could be to implement this subset of matrix. In practice, it could like this, and this one really is hypothetical. Like, please do not read anything into the logos here. But it would basically have normal full-fat matrix here, one of the servers that has uh, got permission to talk through to a gatekeeper, like Google might be in the future, would then talk proper matrix through there, and, oh no, actually, no, sorry, would talk linearized matrix there, and then say that conversation would end up hubbed, and only that conversation, this isn't all the traffic, but there would just be a given hub for that conversation to plug everybody together. And it makes it a lot easier and more practical to actually implement in Bigtable and Erlang or whatever on the right-hand side, whilst also talking to the matrix world on the left-hand side. However, linearized matrix has not gone entirely according to plan, so what we have been doing is working within IETF in this new working group called the More Instant Messaging uh, Interoperability Working Group. Now, this was started by folks from the MLS, Messaging Layer Security, Group End-to-End -End Encryption Working Group. 
And the whole idea is that they want to build, or we want to define a long-term protocol specifically for this subset of DMA interoperability, um, with the added twist of be leveraging all the good stuff that MLS provides, because weirdly enough, if you build MLS, you want to have an application layer protocol that sits on top of MLS. We've been involved in this since the outset, um, ITF114 in Philadelphia back in 2022 now, and you will be surprised to hear that we turned up and said, guys, you don't need to do this, we can just speak Matrix. You know, Matrix already is this amazing end-to-end -end encrypted decentralized communication protocol, and it got promptly rejected because decentralization was seen as overkill. That's why we then came up with linearized matrix, which also then got rejected um, because it was like, hang on a second, this gives us message history. Why would you ever want message history? We don't need message history when talking to gatekeepers. Why does it have key value state events for arbitrary key value data? That sounds very dangerous. We don't want that. And so it went through the ITF process where it gets whittled down and reduced and reduced and reduced to the absolutely minimum subset of stuff that you need and then hopefully perhaps maybe expands out again. Um, one of the big debates has been whether Mimi should support interoperability with today's protocols, like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, and critically the double ratchet, or do you hard code the entire design to require MLS for encryption? So you can imagine that there are a bunch of people who really, really have bet the farm on MLS, and a bunch of slightly more pragmatic people, perhaps, who have bet the farm on just wanting to interoperate with people, and uh, that debate has gone back and forth. So. The, we ended up forming a design team between folks on Matrix side, Cisco, Google, Wire, Phoenix, um, and Wicker, to try to build something from the ground up that would provide this on-ramp from today's double ratchet world into an MLS world. And the idea is that you literally could use this today to interop with double ratchet platforms like Matrix or WhatsApp, but then also provide a really low friction way to steer everybody through to talk MLS. And um, there was a lot of back and forth on how this could look because it basically tries to solve this paradox that on one hand, if you have MLS, you should use it as much as possible. You should use it to synchronize state across the various um, folks in the cryptographic group um, and uh, all, all the sort of benefits of MLS. Um, however, if you don't have MLS, you need to kind of fake something that looks a bit like it out of today's double ratchet and sort of linearized matrix stuff. So we've been trying to glue together two pretty different architectures with a transition path between the two. Um, so we published that um, back in Prague um, in November um, in draft Ralston Mimi protocol. Um, and it, you know, in theory, gets best of both worlds. The layering does end up being a bit complex, though, and so for the last um, couple of weeks, we've discovered that Wire have done an entirely new draft, which we are now trying to merge back together. Yay, team teamwork. So to um, solve today's DMA challenges, meanwhile, whilst we go through this wonderful process with ITF, we've also just been using plain old matrix. So what comes next? I've no idea, honestly. <laughs> no idea what happens come March. We'll see what DMA APIs meta ships on March the 7th. As I said, I'm not allowed to steal their funder on that. Uh, it looks as if we may be in the first organization element to actually implement against them. So whatever happens, hopefully it will involve Matrix one way or another. Um, but that is the shape of DMA things to come. And I don't know why I was speaking so fast, because apparently I've got two and a half minutes left. Have I actually finished early for the first time ever in 10 years of Boston? <laughs> Thank you. So just to remind you, we need help. Friends do not let their friends use proprietary chat services. If you benefit commercially from Matrix and you want us to continue to exist, please support the foundation. Use the QR code, become a member. Run a server or buy an enterprise one from Element. Build bridges and bots on your services. Build your amazing cool new project on Matrix because tragically we're not going to be doing any fancy VR on Matrix or MIDI on Matrix or carry a pigeon over matrix or whatever it might happen to be. You have to build your pigeon teleporter yourselves from now on, but hopefully we've inspired you enough to do so. Um, follow us on Mastodon or indeed Blue Sky or many, many other things and spread the word. Thank you very much. Questions? We have a question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, what's the status of specifying the export import format for a matrix server so you can actually back up matrix rather than backing up Postgres or whatever database is under it? 
I didn't quite catch that. Was there a question on specking the server-to-server -server API to make it easier to implement so, home uh, servers? Right now, a matrix server, be it Conduit or Synapse or whatever, yep. keeps all the data in some data storage. Right. If you want to back up a server... Okay, it. sorry, I, I get the question now. So the question is um, data portability um, between home servers. So you can migrate from Synapse to Dendrite or Dendrite to Conduit or whatever. So there is deliberately not an MSC for defining that right now because what we are trying to do was to do account portability because if you have switched out your matrix IDs for public keys and e you define either, um, uh, I guess, uh, either the client or perhaps the server gets to define the home of the account, then the act of migrating yourself from Synapse to Dendrite would be to basically do an account port, a bit like on GSM, to switch where that public key resides. So rather than having an export format and a great big wadge of JSON or a kind of GDPR DSAR style thing, instead the protocol itself does what it does best, replicating data between different servers, and therefore you wouldn't need an interchange format. Now this has some minor problems. First of all, as you just heard, we've had to stop working on it. And secondly, it doesn't solve the GDPR DSAR use case where you, know, you need to have the data checkout functionality. At the moment, Synapse just does a very blunt way of doing that, or there is a separate tool, I forget what, that expand, exports the data in a huge indigestible blob of JSON. Um, so I think it would be a useful thing to have. It's not something that we're working on at the moment, but if anybody in the room would like to write an MSC for expressing a DSAR format, which could also potentially be used as a quick fix for data portability between implementations, that would be really cool. And I'm sorry that in this instance, perfect has been the enemy of good in that we invested the time that should have been spent doing that in doing account portability rather than DSAR tooling. Excellent question. Anybody during oh. during the super call, uh, video, during the nice video call with everybody joining that you did like a few minutes ago, uh, is there any network optimization where like the clients were talking to each other or they were all going to the cloud and back? Just, just thinking if you, that was something you thought through. Now the acoustic in here is terrible. I don't think how you've been hearing me. I, sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, about the video call where everybody video call, joined? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we were just like considering if that there was any kind of optimization for limiting the bandwidth to the internet or there was any ah, sort of right. peer-to-peer. Okay, so bandwidth control for element cool. Okay, so at the moment, um, uh, the LiveKit SFU has actually got really good um, uh, band rate, uh, bandwidth estimation built into it so that it adapts quite aggressively to your actual network conditions. You saw how little I was using and critically, it renegotiates between different thumbnails, and if you scroll the thumbnails out of sight, they disappear. It, as far as I know, it should be pretty easy to also put additional constraints, either on the client or on the server side, to say, hey, never give me more than 320 by 240, or never give me more than 64K. In that, all of that was going via an SFU on the server side. So there was nothing happening peer-to-peer. -peer. We still have peer-to-peer -peer matrix for doing full mesh. Sorry, it's more full mesh video is still a thing. But if you want it to scale to an entire room like this, then yeah, you need to have the selective forwarding unit um, to go and bounce it around the place. And I can hear you so much better without the microphone. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, I remember that back in the days, you started working on matrix because you had to work on RCS and it was crap. And now RCS is like, become a reality with Google Messages? Uh, are, you, are you planning to make something interoperable, interoperable with this, or uh, you just try to push it away? <laughs> <laughs> it is so annoying to stand on stage and have to say that, unfortunately, we have NDAs, which mean that we can't talk about anything to do with that right now. <laughs> no, that's fine. I tried. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, thank you for keeping up all the good work for the um, DMA stuff. I think a lot of people will profit from that eventually without even knowing like, who actually did that. So, thank you for that. Um, my yeah.
Uh, I should point out that the DMA stuff is all Amandine's fault. She has the right accent and is willing to go to Brussels and talk to people with the right accent, whereas I just came in at the last minute and said, oh, brilliant, let's play with double ratchets. So, but either way, I'm glad that, honestly, we were able collectively to shift it forwards. Um, my actual question would be to Matrix 2.0. Is there uh, like a concrete roadmap how the rollout of Matrix 2.0 will eventually happen and how backwards compatibility, compatibility with, for example, legacy SSO login and will Element X support normal sync eventually for the rollout or something like that? So I got the first half of that. Um, and so a roadmap for Matrix 2.0 is really land the remaining things as rapidly as we can. It's very hard to predict. Um, the pacing of that, because it depends entirely on how it's funded. And uh, you know, the reason it's not going as fast as we would like is that often we end up doing completely other work. Like somebody might turn up and say, look, we need the best screen reader support in Element Web, known to man, at which point the JS SDK and you know, other folks who might be working on the lower levels of Element Web end up doing accessibility, which is great but it can completely starve out the lower level things. And so work that might have happened you know, next month finds itself shifted back six months because everybody was committed to go and you know, do some other requirement. So I'm afraid we don't publish a roadmap on it other than we'll do it as quick as we can. I didn't catch the second half. Backwards compatibility during the rollout. For example, will Element X support legacy home oh, servers right. yep. that don't have sliding sync, for example? No, no way. It's um, hard enough to make Element X as um, snappy as it is without also supporting the legacy authentication or the legacy sync. And frankly, it's also a sort of mechanism to try to get everybody to speak the brave new APIs. Um, so yeah, we are not going to see legacy support there at all. Instead, we will just optimize to make the Matrix 2.0 spec stuff um, as effective as possible. Thank you. Sorry. Going once. Any more questions we haven't seen? Please wave your hand. Ah, there. Okay, up. Hi, so and thank you for a great talk and for all your work, especially on the DMA side. Second that. Uh, when it comes to DMA, the uh, gatekeepers, will they scope DMA access to EU users, or how will that work? That is precisely the sort of thing that if I gave you the answer to, or my guess at the answer to, would get me sued by Meta for breaking an NDA. So I don't know, I'm afraid. Uh, but they should be um, announcing it in the coming weeks, because obviously they need to go live on March the 7th, and they need to try to explain to the world why they have um, upheld the regulation in the way that they have. And honestly, I don't know the answer. I mean, the, the builds which we've been working with are um, sort of coming down to the line. They're all full of lips and text, and they haven't been internationalized, and the UI is very clearly still in flux. So uh, that's what I mean when I say I don't know. We'll see it in the next couple of weeks. Right, any last ones? Oh, over there. So, if I understand correctly, uh, Matrix 2.0 will require multiple services alongside Synapse uh, for sliding sync, for example. Uh, do you have a plan to provide a software distribution that combines all the needed, uh, all the needed services? Thank you. Okay, I think I caught that, which is, is there going to be a distribution that bundles together matrix auth service and sliding sync alongside um, Synapse? Um, so in the long term, we want to have it natively implemented on both. Matrix auth service is designed to be embedded as a Rust module inside the Python sort of host of Synapse. And likewise, sliding sync eventually, I hope, will end up as a native module of some kind there too. In terms of distributions, um, there are various options already. So Element provides its Element Server Suite um, supported distribution, which is the sort of thing that we try to persuade um, governments um, and big enterprises to use. There is also um, Slavis, Matrix, Docker, Ansible Deploy, um, and Ansible Playbooks, which again gathers it all up and runs it as systemd services. 
Um, and I'm sure that there are other like um, Helm charts out there from the community. There are also Helm charts for Bundes Messenger, um, published on Open Code for the German public sector, as well as ones for Open Desk, which is the digital sovereign workspace there. So there are a lot of options out there. Obviously, with my Element CEO hat on, I would really hope that people might actually buy the one from us so that we can keep paying the salary of people to build the underlying technology, but um, you can also go wild with any of the other distributions. The whole thing is starting to feel a bit like Linux, honestly, with different distros done by different people with different licensing and mentalities, uh, which I guess makes us red hat on the Element side. And I have 16 seconds left for any final, final questions. In which case, I am actually going to finish early. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Faustian wants to say also thank you to you with some sweet calories. <laughs>